and that was defined by jk, the odd rod, is equal to the sum over c belonging to the odd crossings of k, the sine of the crossing. And we want to see that, um, we want to show that jk is an invariant for virtual knots. And I remind you uh, how that worked. Uh, for example, if we were looking at the trefoil here, the virtual trefoil, then uh, then uh, the we in order to compute the odd and even crossings, we look at the Gauss code and we just look at the underlying Gauss code without any frills, which goes one two one two, and we see that crossing number one is odd because there are an odd number of uh, places in between one and one, and crossing number two is odd as well, so that in this case J is equal to plus two, and that's a nice example of this invariant J doing something strong because it's proving to us that that knot is non-trivial and that's a good thing. Um, now, uh, we want to show that this is invariant so uh, uh, we can look at the different Reitermeister moves. So first of all, we can look at the first Reitermeister move. And uh, I might have done this before, but it won't take but a moment, and that's a good place to get us started again, right? So no problem with the first Reitermeister move because because this is an even crossing. It it is of the form i i. Some other things happen on either side of it, and there's and there are an even number of things in there, namely zero. Okay, now. What about uh, the second Reitermeister move? Well, in the case of the second Reitermeister move, there is, of course, more than one case. But let's say that we take this case and we start here, A, and then B, we re-enter over here, and we have a crossing I and we have a crossing J. And then uh, the Gauss code is going to look like... Um, um, alpha, and then we're finding ourselves doing I, and then J, and uh, then going along, and then beta, and, um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, J, beta, and then I, J again, right? And then gamma, some further terms that we don't know about. So we're concerned here with um, the interstice between I and I and the interstice between J and J. So if we look at the interstice between I and I, then it is one, this one crossing, plus the number of elements in beta. And if we look at the interstice between J and J, it is 1, the I, plus the number of elements in beta. So, so we see that these are both odd or both even. Now, if they're both even, we won't count them. But if they're both odd, then what about the signs of the crossing? Well... This crossing down here is uh, plus, and this crossing up here is minus. And so if they're both odd, then they contribute plus 1 minus 1 equals 0. And if they're both even, they contribute 0. So in both cases, Cases they contribute zero, and so this this implies that 
uh, J is J K is invariant under Rademeister two. So that's fine, and now we should look at Rademeister three. So again, there's more than one case, but we'll just draw one and take a look. So here is a right Meister three move situation. And and the after. And as I said, of course, there are many cases. I'll just do one case. So let's suppose that we have it this way and that we go in here first and then we go in here and then we go in here. And let's suppose that this is I and this is J and this is K. Then what does the Gauss code look like? It looks like alpha, then I and then J. Then we go in here, beta. Um, with some beta intervening and then a KI, KJ, excuse me, um, and then uh, KI, um, sorry, gamma, and then a KI. Oh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. All right. So that's what the whole Gauss code would look like. And we have the pairs, I, J, um, K, J, and K, I. And if I want to also look at how it is afterwards, then I'm going to, again, start here, go in here, and then go in here. And um, um, let me uh, call this one J and this one I, and this one K. That is the natural relabeling for the other side because you see, if you, um, if you, if you do it that way, then you see that we're going to just reverse everything. You're going to go J I, and then you're going to go J K, and then you're going to go K I K. Um, and so, the Gauss code for this is going to be alpha J I beta J K gamma I K and delta, where these just flip, right? But now, what about the parodies? We want to find out who could be odd, how many could be odd. So we have to look at from I to I and from J to J and from K to K, and write down what the counts would be. Now, I is the longest count. From I to I, I have one, two, three, four actual crossings. And, and that's the same as none, because we're only working mod two. And then we have the number of things in beta plus the number of things in gamma. So that's the, that's the I one. Now, what about the J one? The J one is one plus beta. And the K one is one plus gamma, right? One plus gamma, right. So what does this tell you about the parity? Um, suppose that I is even, for example. Well, that means that um, possibly uh, um, um, uh, beta and gamma are odd. If uh, beta and gamma are odd, then I would be even, but then these would be even, and then you would, they would be at all even. But the other possibility is that I is odd. I'm sorry, that I is even. Uh, but these are both odd, but if these are both, I'm sorry, these are b both even. 
If these are both even, then these will be both odd, and we can have two odd. So it's possible to have one even and two odd. Can you have all three uh, odd? Well, if beta and if beta, if j and k, um, that means that beta and gamma are even. So you see, this will be even. Suppose that i and j were odd. Um, well, um, then um, uh, then. Um, if i and j are odd, then beta would be even, um, um, but that would make gamma uh, odd, and that would make k even. Uh, and so you can check that it's always the case that you can have one even and two odd, or all even. That's the outset, outshot, upshot of examining this. Now, now then, you ask yourself, well, what would it mean to have two of them odd? Well, if you have two of them odd, then you see you're going to be moving them. For example, I and J, um, um, you move them down here. But, but then you see that what I've called J it has exactly the same sign as J, and the one that I've called I has exactly the same sign as I. So there will be no change, and uh, and these have um, uh, and so while these might have the same sign as they do here, there will be no change in the total sum uh, if these two are odd and these two are odd. So this so what I'm saying is that this condition implies the invariance for. R3. So there's a little um, thought that you might want to sit down and check the arithmetic yourself and check the other cases, but, um, but it follows rather easily that that's a situation. And in this case of Gaussian parity, if we run into it again, it's important to understand that we will have this situation where at most two can be odd. You are not going to have one of them odd, and you're not going to have all of them odd. And um, and as for um, detour, does not affect JK. So therefore, JK is in an invariant of virtual knots. Okay, so that takes care of that bit of bookkeeping, but now let's see, uh, let's continue with parity for a little while before I go back to the index polynomial. I want to show you another parity trick. So what I want to talk about now is the Monturoff parity bracket. So this is a modification of the bracket polynomial for virtual knots that takes into account parity, the same kind of parity we were talking about before. Gaussian parity. So we have odd and even crossings. And what we're going to do is the following. One, notify all odd crossings. All right, so if you have a crossing, it's an oriented diagram. Um, you have a crossing and it's odd, then you're going to make it into a graphical node. I'll 
tell you what to do with the graphical nodes later, but they're going to turn into graphical nodes, and you won't do a bracket expansion on them. You now have a gra you now have a knot with graphical nodes diagram two. Ex expand using bracket expansion. on the remaining crossings. You get a sum of coefficients times graphical loops and you evaluate an ordinary loop with no um, no nodes on it no nodes this will be be evaluated as delta, which is our usual, minus a squared, minus a to the minus 2. So it looks just like the ordinary bracket expansion. That's the first part of the evaluation. Secondly, you reduce the graphs. by Reitermeister 2. If there is an available Reitermeister 2, then this will be reduced to this. All right. So that means uh, that, for example, if in the sum, in the state sum, you had this, and some other stuff, then this would reduce to this, and that would then reduce to delta squared times whatever you evaluated this to be, because these always evaluate deltas, okay? So we'll do an example in a moment, but I hope you see the picture of what we're, what we're saying here. Here. Now, I, I just wanted to make this a little easier to read. Now, the, the assertion is that, uh, uh, that this is an invariant. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, but believe me that it's an invariant, and then let's do an example or two. Uh, what what should we call this? We will call this um, parity bracket of K, okay? And, and it takes values in graphs, but the graphs are reduced. So you, you have a unique reduction for the graph, and that stands, that's like an extra variable. There are many, there are many possibilities for the variables. So you might try it out on um, something like what we have been just analyzing, and we'll see that it doesn't do us any good at all. But then we'll try it on something else, and we'll see it does us a lot of good. So if you were working with this critter, then uh, for doing parity bracket, well, you know these are both odd, right? Odd and odd right? One, two, one, two. So, so this then is sent to this. And there aren't any crossings, so there's nothing more to do. But unfortunately, this reduces 
to to this, and that, that's equivalent to this, which is which goes to one in our standard bracket evaluation. So this, though, so the parity bracket of this uh, is one, and we aren't picking up anything about it. Let's try some other examples. What if we were to take another vert of ours? Now, on this one, um, there are no odd crossings. And parity bracket of, of, uh, of this knot is just equal to the bracket. And now, I'll show you an example I like a lot. Let's call this script K. Uh, this is called the Casino diagram because Mr. Casino found it in his thesis. Um, and um, uh, it has some nice properties that make it hard to uh, hard to prove that it's tri non-trivial. Um, it um, it has trivial quandle and fundamental group. I'll leave it to you to try working that out. And it has trivial bracket. Uh, in other words, in other words, uh, the um, the normalized bracket of this is equal to one. Another one of those. Um, in fact, you can you can check that it's z equivalent to a classical on nine. We'll do that on the next slide. But now we're doing parity bracket. What happens with parity bracket? Well, what what is the Gauss code here? Let's see. One, two, three, four. Let's say, all right. So Gauss code. I'll start here. One, two, one, one, two, one, three, four, three, four, two. All right. So one is odd. What about two? Yeah, two is odd. Oh, two, three, four, five, that way. Two is odd. Three is odd. And four is odd. All odd. All odd. All right. But that means what? That means that if we want to um, find the parity bracket of the casino, we notify all the crossings, and then we're done. Um, and then we have to ask whether it reduces, but let's take a close look at it at, at that. So there's the notified casino.
and you don't see any tumors, do you? Uh, and wanted to be very, very careful. You could analyze the code and make sure there were no tumors. But I assure you, there are no tumors, no reductions, no reductions are available. This is actually kind of interesting because you see it is a connected sum of two diagrams. And the two diagrams of which it is a connected sum, in the sense like this, you see, you have a diagram and you take the connected sum right there by cutting this out and connecting it with this one. Um, These diagrams by themselves reduce, right? And the reduction goes by means of this Reitermeister 2 move that's available. But when you connect them up, the Reitermeister 2 move is no longer available. And this is an irreducible diagram. So the result is that we conclude that the, uh, that the parity bracket of the machine no, is equal to the notified Ishino diagram and that it's irreducible and therefore the Kishino is a non trivial virtual knot. So, given that we verified that the parity bracket is a correct construction and is invariant, we have a remarkably simple proof uh, that the Cassino was non-trivial. If we wanted to prove that the Cassino was trivial by some other means, uh, why then it would turn out to be quite a bit harder. Um, I may, if I end up talking about biquandals uh, in a little while, show you a proof using biquandal. But, um, but in order to prove it um, that way, we end up doing some intricacies of algebra. And here it is a tautology. Um, I suggest as an exercise here, you Try out the parity bracket on other examples. Try it out on your own examples. You have some techniques now. Now you might be able to prove those examples are non-trivial by some other means, and or you can try it on this and see how it behaves. And next week I'll show you some more examples of um, of things that I think are interesting to do with the parity bracket. But let's continue to talk about the theory of the parity bracket for now. Let's um, let's go to another slide here and ask ourselves why does this work? What is it that we needed to do to be sure that this was invariant? Well, we, when, we, when we use the bracket, when we do the invariance of the bracket, we have to think about what happens under a Reitermeister 2 move, right? So I have to think Think of the parity bracket under the two move. Now, um, if, if, so we might have, it's possible that these, case one, it's possible that these are both odd. Just going down the logic, they might be both odd. In which case, the parity bracket of this is going to be the parity bracket of this. 
And then by the reduction rule, that's equal to the parity bracket of this. And there's the proof that it's invariant under the first right, under the second Reitermeister move. Maybe I should call this two, uh, under the second Reitermeister move, right? But the other case is even. But then this is this is equal to <coughs> this by the usual argument. Right? We have the usual argument. You expand it and you look at the collection of, of terms and you know that if you have coefficients A and A inverse and use delta, it cancels out. Fine. So that's it. It. You see, the, the doing the parity bracket produces two cases. There is the case where they're both odd, in which case they're notified, but, notif but, but two move notifications are reduced, and that makes it invariant under the second move in that case. The other case is that they're both even, and then it's the usual argument, and we have already seen that in a two move, they're either both even or they're both odd. Now, what about the three move? Well, it might be that none of them are odd, all even. And in that case, this is equal to this. By the usual argument. So that's fine. Fine, and now we have to go to another board. And now without loss of generality that's without loss of generality a common abbreviation that i use that way we can assume uh that this is odd and this is odd and this is even all right the worst case scenario is two odd and one even and i'll put it there and i'll let you worry about anything else like over and over and so on right and then the parity bracket of this is going to be equal to the parity bracket of by definition uh the notified part where this can be expanded so we expand it and we get a times that plus a inverse times this. And now you see we're back in an old story. We're back in a, f a very familiar old story. We have the reduction, the graphical reduction, and the graphical reduction says this will be the same as putting this in the middle. And then we have that it could have been on the other side.
and we see that this is exactly what the expansion would have been from the other half of the rhinomaster move, where it would go down the other way. And there's only one little thing. I'll just put a check mark here, because that's all I needed to do, as because, after all, this is the same as what I would have gotten if those had both been odd. And now I do need to know that they were odd and odd. So now we had better go back and look a couple of slides ago, or I leave it to you as an exercise, that these... If and only if... These odd. And I'll leave it to you as an exercise, all right? You just go back and look at what the odd even count does when you slide those crossings. And remember that all that happened was that you interchanged the I and J, and all the counts remain the same. So the parity counts do not change uh, when you do the Reitermeister move. And so if these two above are both odd, then they will both be odd below. And that means that the whole argument goes through, that you say, okay, it's notified, I expanded on this crossing, then I have something with nodes, but it can be a reduced, but it could have been reduced from here. And that reduction is the reduction from having it on the other side. And therefore, it's invariant under the third right of us move. Cool. So we now, what do we got now? Uh, oh, there's Rhinomaster 1, but it's not invariant under Rhinomaster 1. If you if you have it on Rhinomaster 1, that's an even crossing. And, of course, this will multiply by minus A cubed. Uh, and, and if you have it uh, with the other kind, then this will multiply by minus A to the minus 3. And, and you normalize as usual. So as I said, a good exercise about the parity bracket is to try it out on some other things and see what you can do with it. And next week, I'll give you some more examples. Uh, but this is a really nice insight on the part of Vasily Montura. Um, and it leads to an, um, an idea, which is the idea is to... Search for invariance so that an appropriate picture of of the uh, not our link is the invariant see and Vasily actually has a lot of ideas along those lines and has even written a book about it so um, you might explore that kind of an idea yourself, uh, and particularly you can explore it in relation to thinking about the parity bracket. Um, um, parity bracket. Uh, 
often applies to flat virtual tools. The casino was a good example of a flat virtual. Flat virtual is a quite an interesting subject. Um, in flat virtuals, you see, we don't have an over or an under crossing here. We just have an immersion diagram. But the virtual crossings are distinct from the regular crossings. Um, and here, um, you in flat virtuals, you have flat virtuals. It means that you have flat right on my stream rules. So that means. And virtual crossings detour over ordinary crossings, but not vice versa. So like in this diagram, you you do not have the opportunity to take this and slide it over here like a Rademeister 3 move. It's flat, but but what is forbidden is still forbidden. So you have this, but this is not allowed to be exchanged for this. No. Okay, we can't do that. So that makes the flat diagrams possibly highly non-trivial, even though they're flat. And this guy here is a good example of it. And if you want to do the parity bracket for flat virtuals, you just let A equal A inverse equal 1 and delta equal to minus two and evaluate just as you did before and you get an invariant of flats, no problem. Um, and in, for example, the case of the, of the flat casino, the argument goes exactly as before and the invariant of the flat casino was the notified flat casino. So therefore there is no way to undo that flat diagram, uh, no way at all in the flat category of virtuals. And this, this fact would be really quite a bit harder to prove um, if you tried to use some other method. Any questions about that? Let's continue that. Another example. Um, this has to do with forbidden moves and things. Let's consider this little virtual knot here. Now, if you now remember that there was another forbidden move that I was showing you earlier, and I just wanted to show you that it really is forbidden from the point of view of virtuals. Um, it is forbidden 
to do this. Right? Virtuals can detour over reals, but reals cannot detour over virtuals. If if you were allowed to do the forbidden move on this, you could slide this down and these two would come apart and it would be trivial. So K would be equivalent to the unknot via using forbidden move. What is J of K? Well, let's find out. Uh, let's start walking here, and this will be crossing number one, crossing number two, crossing number one, crossing number two. Well, so the Gauss code is one, two, one, two. And the, the, and the crossings, let's see. There we go. So what have we got? We got a plus crossing there, and we have a plus crossing over here. So J K is equal to two. So you see, K is non-trivial virtual. And that, that implies that the forbidden move is not forbidden move is not a consequence of our given VKT moves. So that's just a matter of uh, an example checking uh, that um, um, that this is the case. And um, here's an exercise for you. K above. Sorry. K above. That guy is equivalent by virtual moves. To our old friend, the virtual trefoil. Not a hard exercise. It's just that this one has been drawn with extra virtual crossings. And I think for the sake of recording it, we shouldn't have too much junk in there. Those are both plus crossings, as anyone can see. All right. So this one has two virtual crossings. But if you were to, for example, walk all the way around from here to there, then you'd see a nice detour that you could perform, cutting it out and putting it somewhere else. And you'll get it over to this easily enough. Try it. And you can check with me next week to see if it worked. Okay, so um, that's a good example. Uh, now we're off to the matter of the affine index polynomial. So let's recall what we did with the affine index polynomial. We want to prove that it's invariant. So uh, I want to re remind you how we do this. So um, maybe I should do it on an example. On the other hand, 
And the examples that I have in mind are a little more complicated than the simplest example. So, so let's just do it on, the, on this relatively simple example once again. So I have a virtual knot and I, I'm, I want to calculate this. Now this is an oriented virtual knot. And I take a flat. projection of it or oriented and I make a labeling um, and it turns out it doesn't matter how you make the labeling you can start with any image or anywhere so I start with a zero somewhere like here and when I go through a virtual crossing I propagate the label when I meet um when i meet a crossing going to the right i bring the label up by one when i meet a crossing going to the right i bring the label up by one when i bring a crossing going to the left and that's what i see here that goes down by one when i see it going to the left it goes down by one um and when i see it going to the left it goes down by one and when I see it going to the right, it goes up by one. And when I come back to where I started, if I haven't made any arithmetical errors, the labeling will be fitting. And you can check that that is so. That's a two. So then at every crossing, I have some labeling and it will have the general form of an A comes in here and this will be an A plus one and a B is coming in here and this will be a B minus one. And then I have here from, if this is oriented from left to right, then I'm going to have the W plus weight from here. And here I'm going to have the W minus weight from here. And the W plus is equal to the left minus the right, B minus A minus 1. And the W minus is equal to the left minus the right, which is A minus B plus 1, coming from below. And you'll notice that W minus is equal to minus W plus. These are the weights. So we'll once it is labeled, it has weights. And so in this case, we could write down the weight. Suppose that this crossing is A and this crossing is B and this crossing is C. Then I'll make a little table of the weights. So we look at crossing A, and we see 0 minus 2 is minus 2. And below, um, 1 minus minus 1 is 2. And uh, I, I do it this way, so I double check. And then um, we're at B now, and we have 2 minus 0 is 2. And minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2. All right. And at C... I have 1 minus 1 is 0, and 0 minus 0 is 0, so we got a 0 there. Now, the polynomial of a given knot is equal to the sum over the crossing. sine of crossing t 
ability to weight of crossing minus rive of diagram, which means minus the sum of the signs of the diagram. So another way of putting it is it's equal to the sum over C belonging to the crossings of K of sine of C multiplied by T to the weight of C minus one. And what is the weight of a crossing? The weight of a crossing is equal to W sub sine of crossing. That is, it's W plus if the crossing is plus, and it's W minus if the crossing is minus. So that's the de definition of our polynomial. So really, Really, you see, it's just the weights and the signs uh, as a list, but put into a polynomial kind of list. And what is the polynomial that we're going to get here? The polynomial for that knot over there is going to be equal to, well, let's see, this is plus, and that's plus, and this one's minus, but it isn't contributing. Um, so uh, we could write it this way. It is t to the minus 2. plus t squared uh, minus t to the zero following the slavishly following the um, definition, right? Because we get a t to the zero here and a minus sign because it's a negative crossing. And then we have to subtract the rive. And the rive is plus plus minus. So that's the rive is plus one. So we have to to subtract plus one. And this is the same as t to the minus two plus t squared minus two. And now you see a shortcut that I like to use. If I get all of the non-zero powers of t written out, then all I have to do is subtract that number which will make the sum of these coefficients cancel. So 1 and 1 is 2, I put in minus 2. So I don't actually have to calculate the rive again. What we found is that pk is non-trivial, and that implies that this is a non-trivial virtual knot. Now, what are the properties of pk, and how can we prove them? That's the rest of our work for today. So, so the theorem is pk of t is a vir virtual knot invariant And one, if K is classical, then PK is zero. So you can tell something is non-classical if it gets to be non-trivial. So that, that knot we just wrote down above is, is now known to be not classical. Um, um, P of the mirror image is equal to minus PK of T inverse, all right? So if you take 
the mirror image knot, you, re, you put a minus sign across the whole polynomial and you invert the variable. In this k star is equal to the mirror image of k. which means reverse all crossings. Okay, and thirdly, and this is quite interesting, P of K reverse of T is equal to PK of T inverse. Or K reverse, K reverse is equal to K with reverse orientation. So it has not actually the case that you can detect the difference between some virtual knots and the reverse orientation version of that virtual knot by computing this polynomial. If it, if it isn't symmetric under the T-T inverse interchange, then it won't be equivalent to its reversal. Um, in classical knot theory, it's um, really a very hard problem in general to tell to prove that a knot is inequivalent to its reverse. We could come back next week and show some examples in classical knot theory of knots that are not equivalent to their reverse. But uh, in virtual knot theory, it turns out to be easier to detect some of them. And of course, the general problem of knowing when a knot is equivalent to its reverse is an unsolved problem, both in classical and in virtual knot theory. That's very intriguing. You can reverse the arrow and get somebody different. Um, so these are the basic properties of the affine polynomial. And then there's one more, which we'll discuss next week. PK is a concordance invariant. And um, this will be discussed next week. Concordance is the, the analog in the virtual knot theory of bounding a tube in four space. In, in classical knot theory, if you take the three sphere across the unit interval and have a tube that goes embedded in there from one three sphere to the other, we say that two knots are concordant if there is that, which is a kind of generalization of isotopy. Um, and PK is a concordance invariant. But we'll talk about that next week. Let's talk about these properties right now. Now, what about the invariants? Let's think about the invariant. This part. Now you understand what's involved in doing this part. You understand that we have to look at the second right of must remove and the third right of must remove and the first right of must remove and see what happens in each case, right? Uh, so since we're in our last half hour today, um, I think I will do the second right of must remove and, um, and then we can finish off the third randomized remove next time, all right? Um, because I want to show you about these mirror properties and do an example or two. So what would happen in the case of, um, of a second Reitermeister move. 
let's suppose we, we take this orientation. You can do the other one yourself, okay? There are two of them. Or it goes this way, or it goes this way. And over here in the, in the flat labeling part, the labeling could go like this, maybe zero here. And then we would be going to the right, so this will be a one. And then we come back, uh, and we're back to zero here. And here I might have, um, oh, maybe I should do it with A's and B's. And, well, um, I'll leave it as zero and one, because it could have put the zero anywhere. But let's put an A here. And then there's an A, and then there's going to be an A minus one. And then there's going to be an A. Hmm? So, so now let's write down what the contributions are in both cases. This is, um, I think it's more symmetrical to use the A and the B in doing this. Somehow feels more, more, more symmetrical. So there's a B here, then it goes into the B minus one, and then this goes into to B again. So well, that's our picture. Um, and, um, and we now know what the weights are, at least abstractly, in, both, in all cases. Now, what do we have here? We have a negative crossing. And what do we have here? We have a positive crossing. So we can write down the contributions of the, of the polynomial in the in the, in the case of this crossing, the contribution is going to be sine of crossing, which is plus t to the w plus. And w plus is a minus b plus 1. All right. And then over here, Uh, it's a negative crossing, minus t to the, and then it's the negative crossing contribution, which is over here. And that's equal to a minus 1 minus b. And I made a mistake. Let's see. Let's go carefully through again. I want them to cancel, of course, right? Uh, so I started with a label A and a label B coming in. This label went to it one down and then back up. And this label went one up and then one down. Okay, so that was a plus one and this was a, went back down to B. That meant that over here we had the W plus is A minus B minus one. And over here, we had a minus 1 minus b, just as before, and they're the same. And so, as you see, um, together, the contribution is 0, and that implies that p of, of this will be equal to p of this. And then the exercise, which we which I think you should do is the um, easy first part is this one. Second randomizer move with the opposite orientation and B, third randomizer move and cases. All right. And um, then you will have a proof in your hands that this in polynomial is invariant. It's all very easy. Uh, bookkeeping uh, it just works. All right. So um, we'll go over it next time. But um, but I, I suggest if you want to get your hands in this invariant and feel of how it works, try the exercises. Now let's talk about 
those inver those ways uh, that it behaves under mirror imaging and so on. Let's think about that. So here's a crossing, and here's the mirror image crossing. And here's the flat part where we have the labeling. And let's suppose that you have an A coming in here and a B coming in here so that you have an A plus one here and a B minus one here, and so that you can get a W plus and a W minus. Minus, right? Um, and uh, the W plus is equal to B minus A minus 1, and the W minus is equal to A minus B plus 1, which of course is minus W plus. So that's our reference frame. Now, what is the contribution going to be here? It's a positive crossing. So we're going to get plus T to the W plus, and, uh, and what are we going to get here? Well, it's a negative crossing, and so we're going to get minus T to the W minus. And that's equal to minus T to the minus W plus. And that's equal to minus T inverse to the W plus. Plus. And now you just think about everything I wrote and see that this implies that P of the mirror image as a function of T is equal to minus P with no mirror image as a function of T inverse. Because that's how you get contribution to PK to the contribution contribution to PK star as you put a minus sign and T inverse. And of course, you'll note that the ride of K star is just the change of signs is equal to minus the ride of K. So that takes care of the ride term. So everything is taken care of. And that's the proof that pk star is minus pk t inverse. Great, we're done with that. Now what about the reversal? This is more interesting. We have to think a little more carefully about what's happening with the reversal. Remember that really what's going on when you calculated um, weights is that you have a loop and it comes back and returns to itself like this. I'll do it case, but you'll see the pattern. So let's suppose that we started here, and we went around the loop this way, and we came back here. And let's suppose that we met some guys along the way, and let me make them all uh, push-ups, but they don't have to be. They could be some down and some up, whatever. Um, th and this loop could have some self-looping in it, and I'll let you try that out yourself. But what I want to compare that with, this is K. I want to compare with K reverse. And in K reverse, we're going to have the same thing. We're going to have a loop. And we're going to have some things that meet the loop. Virtual crossings that don't meet the loop don't count. So I'm just thinking of real crossings that meet the loop. But it's going to go back or along the same track in the other direction. And, and these all are reversed as well, because it's a knot, and everybody got reversed. So this is typically what it would be like to go around the loop in the reversed version of the knot. So now let's give it a try, just to see what the calculation will be like. Because um, if it was, um, well, let's suppose that the crossing that I'm interested in uh, is positive, let's say, all right? Now, when we reverse the knot, that's for this one. And uh, if when we reverse the knot, 
then the crossing will be this one, and it's still positive, right? So it's a positive crossing, and it's still a positive crossing. So that means that when I calculate um, to find uh, the, the weight difference, I'll be calculating here, right? The W plus, oops, let's not make that error. Uh, where will I be calculating my W plus? From left to right, right? So the W plus will be happening here. And over here in the, this is for, for K, and this is for K reversed. And where will I be calculating the W plus here? Over here. All right. So that's how we have to look at the labelings. But now let's see what happens to the labelings. I start with an A here. And then I go A minus 1. And then I go A plus 1, because A, A, back to A, because I've met this guy. And then I go A plus 1. And then I meet this guy, and I go A plus 2. And then I meet this guy, and it's another, so well, it's A plus 3. So that's how it looked this time, like that. Now, I don't have to know anything except that much of the total labeling, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter what A is. It's just the difference in going around the loop that gets the weight. So here, um, I could start with a B, and then I'm going to have a B plus 1 here, and then a B plus 2, and then I'm going to have a B plus 3, and I'm having a B plus 4, and then b plus 3. Now, what is the weight difference that I'm interested in here? It's this one. And the weight difference is minus 3. Now, what happened here? The, this is where I'm doing it, and I'm getting 1 minus 4, it's minus 3. No, it's not. Oh, very good. Because uh, if it were minus 3, I'd be in trouble. But you see, it's 4 minus 1, right? That's the direction of my calculation. So I get 3. So what I found was that the what I'm finding is that the W plus for K reversed is equal to minus the W plus for K. And the sign is the same. I didn't change the sign. When I reverse the knot, the signs are the same at each crossing. And what I'm saying is that if you simply look at what happens when you calculate the trip going all the way around in one direction, and you reverse that direction, and reverse all the arrows along that direction, and check what the difference is that you calculate, you find it's exactly the same with a change of sign. And that is that is the proof that peak K reverse of t is equal to pk of t inverse. That the weights remain same sign, but they all flip. Here, yeah, all go from plus to minus. And my little calculation here, you could just um, think about it a little bit and see that it's completely general. Um, that um, it's because everybody flips, of course. It isn't just that you flip 
this one, but you flip all of the people that are coming in. Uh, so it gives you the same basic calculation, but you get the opposite sign. Um, so that is the proof of that. And um, I think we have time to do an example to show you this happening. And then we'll stop today. This is a nice example. It'll be a rather nice example. So there's an example. I want to calculate this. So um, here's an exercise. K is Z equivalent to the classical long knot. Remember that. C equivalence is, is this, or equivalently, and, and if something is Z equivalent to a classical or not, it has a trivial bracket polynomial, right? So, if we calculate this and find out that it has some interesting properties, it would be not be being shown by the bracket. So, so let's um, let's get our flat diagram. All right, and let's say I start with a zero here. Then that zero propagates over to here and becomes a minus one. The minus one meets here and becomes a zero. The zero propagates up to here and becomes a plus one. The one propagates around to here and uh, becomes a two. And the two then becomes a one when it goes through there. And that one then becomes a zero when it goes through there. And there we are, that's the whole labeling. And then we want our chart for A, A and B and C. So I claim a minus two, two, one minus one, and one minus one. Let's see if I, if you agree with me. We go to A. Here's A, and um, and we want um, we want the minus two and two, right? And B, uh, B 
B is 1 and minus 1 in B. And C is 2 minus 1 is 1 and 0 minus 1 is minus 1. So that's right. Now, um, what about the sign of crossings? Uh, this crossing here is a minus, and this crossing here is a plus, and this crossing over here is a minus. So, well, that says that PK is going to be equal to, for A, we take the minus, so it's going to be minus T squared. Then for B, we take the plus, and it's going to be plus T. And for C, we take the minus, so it's going to be minus T inverse. And then the sum of these is uh, minus 1, so we add 1. And that is our polynomial. That's PK. Now, what about PK star and PK inverse? Well, PK reverse, PK reverse is obtained by reversing all the T's. So we get minus T to the minus 2 plus T inverse minus T plus 1. And PK star is the negative of that. So that's t to the minus 2 minus t inverse plus t and minus 1. And you see that um, um, if you compare these two, we see that k is not equivalent to its reverse. k is not equivalent to its mirror image. And, of course, the mirror image is not equivalent to the reverse. And maybe you can deduce a few more things. But this is a good example of enough asymmetry, so we really know that this knot, if you reverse the arrow on it, you wouldn't be able to move it until it turned into itself. Um, so that's a good place to stop for today. Um, and as you see... Uh, the, this invariant provides lots of examples for you, one to play with because you don't need a computer to get into the complexity of it. Um, you can just write down a diagram and then you have lots of examples, not only because you can calculate a specific one quickly, but you could ask questions about the other examples that lie over the, over the flat diagram. Once you have the weights, if you... If you put in positive or negative crossings here and get a diagram, why then you immediately have the polynomial. So you can um, you can investigate a lot, and I'm sure that there that because of that uh, there are many other properties of this polynomial that are waiting to be discovered. If you would be thinking about it, or I would, and so that's a good place for us to come to. Uh, stop for today now. Wait, I'm sorry. I already got out of screen share. There we go. Right. Any questions? So, thank you for the nice lecture. And if there is no question, I have a small announcement. Uh, Next week, uh, our laboratory, Laboratory of Topology and Dynamics of Novosibir State University, uh, organizes a workshop on computer methods in national topology. But uh, it is planned, uh, it is planned uh, for students and postgraduate students, so the lectures will be given in Russian. Uh, the program of the workshop uh, includes two. Oh, let me demonstrate the screen, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, the program of this workshop includes two mini courses. So the first one will be given by Professor uh, Evgeny Feminich from uh, St. Petersburg University. And he will talk about, he will explain how to calculate invariance and how to tabulate uh, 
three manifolds uh, with using computer program Snappy and computer program Recognizer developed in Chelyabinsk. And the second mini course will be given by uh, young computer developer Nikolai Ruskich from Academ Gen uh, and Yershov Institute of Informatical Systems. Uh, and he will explain how to use machine learning in, uh, uh, to recognize uh, the trivial node from rectangular diagrams. <clears throat> so uh, you're welcome to join these uh, online Zoom lectures. So that's it. Uh, what, day, what, day, uh, um, what day is that given? Oh, yes. Um, the first lecture will be given on Tuesday. Uh, it's coming um, Tuesday? Yes. Then mm -hmm. uh, every day from Tuesday to Friday, uh, one lecture every day and two lectures on Saturday. Um, now, are we going to have this course next Saturday or are uh, we going yes. to adjourn? Yes, right. Uh, so uh, as usual, uh, next Saturday, we, we will have your lecture and right after it, uh, we will start the lectures by Nikolai Ruskich. So, so probably we will have some break. Oh, I see. So uh, so Nikolai's lecture will follow mine. Ye yes, right. Oh, very good. Um, All right. Um, in that case, um, I think I will talk about the uh, Dienikov moves um, a bit during that lecture because that's background to what uh, Nikolai and I and Iskander uh, have been doing, which you will be talking about. Yeah, this would be great. Mm -hmm. And because, you could um, send me a schedule of this. I may, I, I may try some of the lectures, even if they are in Russian. Certainly. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. I guess that's it then. We'll see you all next week. See you next week. Uh, thank you. Thank you.